So welcome to part two of our series on newton raphson methods for solving nonlinear equations. My name is John Gardner, I'm a professor of mechanical and biomedical engineering at Boise State University. In the first part, we talked about uh, one-dimensional uh, problems, in other words, functions, a single function of a single variable, and we looked at a graphic representation of that uh, method as uh, curves and lines. Uh, but, but the approach is really more analytical, more mathematical, and that's what we're going to explore here as we expand it to problems in um, two equations and two unknowns. So, um, so we're going to look, we're, you know, we're going to extend it to multifunctional, but let's look at the example of two equations and two unknowns. So previously we thought of a function as defining a, a curve on a plane, on the xy plane. Now, uh, now we have to think of them as, def as defining a surface in space and it not necessarily a flat surface. Um, and then we take derivatives along those surfaces, uh, and these, these are now partial derivatives because we have more than one variable in the, in the function. And then our approximations or updates represent planes that are parallel to the surface, not lines parallel to the curves. Um, and, and when we find our update to our um, to our guess, to, you know, as we, we iterate on our solution, uh, it requires a matrix inversion. So those are the features of how this is going to vary as we go from the one-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. So here's the mathematical definition of the problem. We have two functions, f1 and f2, of two variables, x1 and x2, and those two variables show up in each of the formulas. And we're looking for those values of x1 and x2, which together will drive those two functions to zero. So it's two equations, two unknowns, uh, mathematically certainly possible. And again, we start with the Taylor series expansion of the uh, of the functions, um, and I'll use this uh, these uh, subscript zero to represent our initial guess. So this is the initial guess for variable one. Here's the initial guess for variable two. And uh, where before we just took the derivative of f with respect to x, now we have to take the partial derivatives of these functions with respect to the different variables. So the first one is with respect to x one, and that's times x one hat. This little correction factor. Um, that we have. Remember, we, the first step was to transform our variables x into a sum of x0 and x hat. So our x0s, of course, have already shown up here, and now here's our x hats. And again, just like in the previous problem, these partial derivatives, once we analytically take the partial derivatives, substitute the, uh, the, our initial guess, they just become numbers. These are just coefficients. Um, the nom a little clarification here. Here I'm showing the different initial guesses as separate variables. Here I'm using a matrix represent or a vector representation. So, so the way you would read this line here is that this is the partial derivative of f1 with respect to x1 evaluated at x equals x0, which is the two, and that implies both both of the variables. Now the second one, this is this first line is about f1. So the second term in here is partial derivative of f1 with respect to x2 times x2 hat. And then the second uh, line is the second function. There's the second function evaluated at our, our initial guess. And now here's two more partial derivatives of f2 evaluated at the operating period. So you kind of see the symmetry here and see what the, what the subscripts mean. So um, solving for x hat gives us this, uh, this mat matrix form here where uh, the x1 hats are uh, um, are the are are represented by taking these the, the functions evaluated at, at the initial guess, uh, multi pre multiplying times the inverse of this matrix of these partial derivatives. It's kind of messy again. Apologize, but that's the way it is. But keep in mind that each one of these partial derivatives is just a number. This is just a two by two matrix with numbers on it. You take the inverse, multiply it times t th these two functions. These this by the way and the mathematical are. In, numerical methods problems. These are called residuals, right? This is a measure of how close we are, how close x0 got us to our initial guess. So these are just numbers, pre-multiplied times this matrix, and you get our updates. So um, that's in a broad brush, really quick, looking at the mathematics. I think it'll be clearer for us if we look at it for uh, the four bar linkage, as we talked about before. So I've, as what I've drawn here is a little representation of four bar linkage, and, and I've got kind of two things on top of each other. So blue, the, the links are shown in blue, and it's, you know, it's no, nothing very surprising there. Um, and then I, I've kind of laid nearby, kind of sketched in, the position vectors for each of the links. So R2 goes from the origin here to the end of link 2, R3 uh, goes along the coupler, 
then back to the origin, R1 goes along the line, the x-axis, to the second uh, pivot point, and then R4 comes up here. So the vectors uh, meet at this point um, up there, which gives us this um, vector equation, R2 plus R3 equals R1 plus R4, um, just like what we did in the quiz. And then I'm going to take the next step and say, let's break it down uh, to the um, x and y components. So these two equations below are the x and y components. Let me go back a slide and take a look at this again. I haven't labeled theta, theta 2, but theta 2 is this angle, the base of the R2 vector from the positive x-axis. R3 is an angle down here from the base of the R3 vector from the positive r-axis. So in this case, R2 is what, about 45, 40 to 45 degrees. R3 is more like about 15 degrees. R4 is measured from the, to the base of the R4 vector from the positive x-axis, which continues out in this direction. So this is pretty close to 90 degrees. And finally, R1, you know, we, we almost always set up our coordinate system so that the x-axis goes through the other pivot point, which by definition makes the, the angle of R1 constant and makes it zero. So the theta 1 is often just assumed to be zero, but keep an eye for that. Make sure we do it right. Um, and that's and that's how we come up with these terms. So theta two is is kind of where we start. That's usually given to us. Theta three and theta four is what we're trying to find. R one is in this case, if we were being very careful, we'd say this is R one cosine of theta one. Theta one is zero, so that's R one of times one. And in the y direction, we have the same form, but in with sines instead of cosines. Again, if I was being very uh, complete, I'd say uh, on this side of the equal sign, I'd say R one sine of theta one. Again, theta one is zero. Sine of theta one is zero, so that term drops out. So these, this is, this makes up the um, essence of our two equations and two unknowns. And what we're trying to find is theta three and theta four. So let's kind of start using the right language in here, the right variables. So f one is a function of theta three and theta four. F two is a function of theta three and theta four. Uh, and here they are. So this is just those same uh, x and y components, but I but I've now put them in this format. So I brought the r1 and r4s over from the right hand side to the left hand side. That's where they picked up these minus signs. So here are here are the two equations we want to solve for our for the the um, the situation, and um, and the unknowns are theta three and theta four. I've just recapitulated those equations right up here. That's exactly what was on the previous slide. And now I'm looking at the Taylor series expansion. And um, I want you, you're going to want to spend some time on this one. What I suggest you do is pause the video at this point and, uh, and go ahead and carry out those partial derivatives. But let me walk you through it, right? So what, we're, what Taylor series says is that this function can be approximated by um, the function evaluated at some initial guess, and I'm calling it 3, 0, and 4, 0. Um, and then, then, the, then there's two partial derivative terms. Partial derivative of the f of f1 with respect to theta 3, partial derivative of f1 with respect to theta 4, and these are evaluated at the initial guess and multiplied times these hat terms. So let's walk through at least this first one, right? So partial derivative of this function with respect to theta 3 uh, is a, there's a lot of zeros. The only place you'll get a non-zero result is if theta 3 exists in the term. And here's the term with theta 3 in it. The derivative of the cosine of theta 3 with respect to theta 3 is minus the sine of theta 3. Okay, so we have my, and, and the, the constant in front of it, r3, the length of length 3, just is multiplied through in a linear fashion. So, so we have minus r3 sine of theta 3 evaluated at the zero position or the initial guess. That's why the theta 3 zero shows up in here times theta 3 hat. Now keep in mind that we have numerical values for these theta 3 zeros. We can assume we know them. So this sine of theta 3 just evaluates to a number. We know r3 that evaluates to a number. So this is just a coefficient. We take the, this derivative with respect to theta 4. Again, there's no theta 4 in most of these terms, just in this last term. And so we get a minus r4 sine of theta 4. But remember, there is a minus sign already. So that comes through as a plus sign. So again, stop the video, carry, th carry out these partial derivatives, and, and verify that you get the same answer I did, which is shown below here. So um, now, uh, basically, I want to put this in, in uh, matrix form. So 
the fact that I asked you that in the first quiz is uh, should have been a hint I'll be actually using this so remember we're trying to find the situation where these functions equal zero so on the left hand side I show the functions right hand side I'm showing zero and in between is this approximation we just did right so so I want to take from you know this line over to the right and put it in a matrix form so uh, we get f1 f2 is approximately equal to these functions evaluated at the at its initial guess uh, and then there, we have this two by two matrix times theta three hat and theta four hat equals zero so again um, if uh, you know this would be a good time to maybe stop the video and 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 as an exercise for yourself you know write those down and get to this point at the same time so the next step is to just take this lower equation and solve for these update variables theta three hat theta four hat and you get this equation theta three hat theta four hat is equal to this two by two matrix inverted that's what the minus one means times this vector of the functions with minus signs in front of them simple matrix multiplication uh, in a matlab environment this is a single line of code it's really straightforward um, and, and just as an aside here this matrix of the partial derivatives has a name in mathematics parlance it's called the Jacobian matrix and it's uh, it's it's used in a lot of different um, mathematical techniques so the algorithm that we're going to develop looks exactly the same way right um, in fact that this little flow chart here is exactly the one I used from the previous one uh, from the single di uh, dimensional problem but I just added this um, kind of this um, annotation here to talk about the fact that the, what's meant in these boxes now changes a bit when you get to, to a higher dimension so x0 isn't a single guess it's a guess of, of two of the, of the two variables in this case theta 3 and theta 4 um, uh, and, then, and again evaluating f is now evaluating a, fank, a vector of two, uh, two functional values and so instead of saying is it close to 0 we want to say is the norm of that vector close to zero in uh, if you remember from the MATLAB code I actually had an absolute value uh, on the functional thing so this is the, nor the norm is the um, vector equivalent of an absolute value the, the next step in this line was evaluating the partial derivative in the one-dimensional problem that's the slope in this case it's a two by two matrix of partial derivatives known as the Jacobian matrix and and the update instead of a single line like this it's that vector equation you take the inverse of the Jacobian multiply it times the those residual values the functions evaluated x0 with a minus sign in there so uh, here's a piece of code that uh, I wrote uh, that should work so here's um, three link lengths um, or four link lengths this is by the way problem uh, 1.4 in the textbook the same one you worked on for problem 2 on the homework assignment Here's a, a value of theta 2, um, 45 degrees, but I convert to radians because that's how most of the world works. Um, I have an initial guess for theta 3. I said, eh, it's probably close to 0. And, um, and theta um, 4 is close to 90. And then I um, evaluate the functions. So here's, here's the x um, component of the matrix equation, and here's the y component of the vector. Of the vector equation uh, the, it's in the that vector equation is also called the loop closure equation so these two functions together make up the x and y components of the loop closure equation and now my convergence criterion is as long as the norm is greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 6 keep going through this um, the first line is is to populate the Jacobian matrix I call the J uh, and so it's the, you'll notice it's the same components we had before um, uh, and then I calculate create this update vector a two element update vector by inverse of j times the functional values um, and I mean just just to show here I, I, I was a little when I wrote this code I made a slight change compared to what I just walked you through the minus sign for the functions are buried in these function evaluations so I didn't need them here so um, that has to do with um, the way I derived it the first time through so uh, as long as there's a minus sign somewhere in there this will work just fine uh, so then the 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 new uh, guess for theta 3 is the old guess plus the first element of my little update vector same thing here for theta 4 
reevaluate my functions because when I go back up in the loop I miss that evaluation and it'll just keep iterating until it uh, finds an answer. As I want you to do um, is to go ahead and paste that code into, into MATLAB, not past, paste the snippet into MATLAB, um, and get it working and verify it against problem 2.1 in the, in the homework. In other words, you you used, uh, you did the homework assignment and you evaluated that for a certain angle. Well, put the angle you had in there and see if it gets you the same answer. Um, and then, and then uh, again, to give you some more computing and uh, some more programming experience, put a loop around that and have it compute the solution uh, for all of theta 2, for all the values of theta 2, uh, for every 5 degrees around the circle. Um, and then, you know, look at, use MATLAB to plot the results and look at theta 3 and theta 4 and how they change. And then if you really want to, again, want to own this code and really want to be good at MATLAB, go ahead and add the code to find the coordinates of the coupler point, of point C, and then use that to plot the coupler path. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, this is kind of about where we'll pick this up on Friday in class. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense and you got a lot out of it and we'll talk to you soon.